My name is Frank Bloomfield and I'm the director of the Liggins Institute and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening for this Liggins Institute professorial inaugural lecture. I'd particularly like to welcome Manfred and Jutta, Martin's parents who have come over from Germany and who are here to um, see him tonight. So before we begin, um, just the usual housekeeping, please. If you could please all turn your mobile phones off or to silent. Bathrooms are either across the atrium or down the corridor to the right. And if there's an emergency, the sirens and lights will flash and sound and we all gather outside in the sunshine. Thank you. So tonight is an inaugural lecture for a new professor. And inaugural lectures acknowledge the, either the appointment or promotion to the professoriate of the University of Auckland. The professoriate, of course, is the highest academic rank, and as such, it is worthy of noting and celebration, particularly when in an institution that's a world-class institution such as the University of Auckland. Academia and universities, of course, are ancient institutions and date back to the 12th century, and the academic regalia that we see and that Martin's enjoying wearing for the first time also stem from that time when the early academics were all monks and these essentially evolved from um, ecclesiastical vestments. And the hoods were, of course, the cowls of the monks that kept them warm in the cold libraries at night. Although I have heard that at some inaugural lectures, the, the inaugural professor who has delivered the lecture is made to stand at the front with his back to the audience at the end of the lecture and everyone drops a little note with a yes or no into the hood, deciding whether the person should be admitted to the professoriate or not. But I don't think we'll initiate that tonight, Martin. Yeah, so. <laughs> and the particular colours um, are a more recent invention and come from about the 16th century. And those in Auckland are based on the design and the colours in Auckland are based on those from the University of Auckland. Now, uh, Cambridge. Cambridge. Now, the university that Martin graduated from, which is Constance University in Germany, um, doesn't have any of its own gowns. And Martin tells me that they don't really celebrate graduation and things like that with much pomp. In fact, his PhD, I believe, was awarded with a handshake in an office by the chair of the department. And so Martin today is wearing the um, academic regalia of a PhD from the University of Auckland. So tonight I'm going to ask um, distinguished professor Jane Harding if she will introduce our new professor, um, Professor Martin Kussman. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Frank. I think it's probably significant that my gown doesn't have a hood at all, so nobody gets to vote. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Martin Kussmann was born and educated in Germany, graduating with a bachelor's degree in chemistry from the University of Aachen and a master's in analytical chemistry from, as you just heard, Universitat Konstanz. His doctoral research in biochemical, analytical biochemistry was undertaken there and also at the University of California, San Francisco, where he specialized in proteomics and genomics. This was surely an indication of a career to come. So having crossed the Atlantic from Germany to California, he then headed north to Sweden for his postdoctoral training in mass spectrometry and prote proteomics at Sundansk Universitat in Sweden, where he also worked with Pharmacia Upjohn on protein interactions and drug development. He then, being Martin, set about acquiring a bit more research experience and seeing a bit more of the world. His subsequent roles included posts as a staff scientist in proteomics at Servius Pharma in Switzerland, and a post as group leader in mass spectroscopy and robotics at Geneva Proteomics. In 2003, he joined Nestlé Research Centre as a group leader in functional genomics, where he built and managed a team of 20 involved in nutrigenomics and nutri-epigenetics. I told you this was the beginning of a theme. And from there, he joined Nestlé Institute of Health Sciences in Lausanne in Switzerland as head of the Molecular Biomarkers Corps, which included proteomics, metabolomics, lipidomics, micronutrient analysis, and their clinical applications. And while doing all this, 
He also acquired appointments as an honorary professor for nutritional sciences at the University of Aarhus in, De in Denmark and a lecturer at the Ecole Polytechnique Federale Lausanne, both of them, amongst other things, teaching nutrigenomics. So by now, Martin's worked in at least five different countries, speaks four different languages fluently and a smattering of a few others, has acquired extensive experience in pharmaceuticals, nutrition, biotech startups, as well as, of course, all those omics. <laughs> this was clearly all the perfect preparation for a new challenge. How far away could he go this time? So he came across the world as far as it was possible to take up an appointment at the University of Auckland in 2016 as the Professor of Systems Biology in Nutrition and Health at the Liggins Institute and as Scientific Director of the High Value Nutrition National Science Challenge. Martin has authored more than 130 publications. He's in demand internationally as an author and speaker. He serves on the science advisory boards of Keystone Symposia and the Human Proteome Organization and the Omics Group. And his list of editorial boards won't surprise you if you tell you, amongst others, they are Frontiers of Genes and Nutrition, Applied and Transnational Genomics, the Journal of Proteomics, the Omics Journal of Integrated Biology, and the Journal of Integrated Omics several of which I had not heard of before. In fact, if you hadn't noticed by now, he knows quite a bit about omics. <laughs> and he's also not very good at staying in one place. But he is very good at being collaborative and talking to lots of people. So much so that the first public lecture he gave here in Auckland included in the audience a couple of people whose only link to the topic or the university was that Martin had got to chatting them in a surf shop the day before. So if any stray surfies in the audience tonight, you're most welcome. It's a great pleasure to welcome Martin here in his inaugural lecture. He's going to introduce us to his world of systems biology and omics, and also explain to us why a science career plan does not make sense. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Martin Kussmann. There's not much left to talk about. <laughs> Jane said everything. I should say kia ora. Uh, I speak a few languages, but I have a very strong accent when I speak Maori, so the rest will be in English. Um, I am particularly honored um, to wear this, uh, not only because it's the colors of the university, it's also the colors of Germany, actually. <laughs> And um, I would like to uh, take you now uh, through my talk, uh, which has a bit of an unusual title. Oh, can I, can I, can I do this deliver without that hat? Because I'm so excited and I'm already, <laughs> I'm already a little sweaty. So um, this is by no means uh, a lack of respect, but I feel a little more comfortable. Um, so I want to take you through a talk that is entitled Science, Why a Science Career Plan does, in my view, not make sense. Uh, and I will also take you through a sunrise over Monument Valley. Some of you have seen this already, so my apologies. But this is dedicated to my parents, because we were there in 1983, and also to my family. We were there last year. Um, so I, I chose this title. Let's see whether this, this works here. Um, ah, there, there you go. Um, I've chosen this title because um, unlike some corporate thinking about uh, human resources, uh, and I come from a more corporate world uh, where people think you can plan your career, um, I, I think that really doesn't work. I, I believe that in, especially in science, uh, the, your career path or your, your way of life is basically, uh, in my view, a result of an interaction between your passion and your exposure, uh, so basically whom you meet on your way uh, and where, where you live. And this is, in my view, a nice analogy to gene-environment interactions we are uh, today uh, studying, where we thought, and I will come to this theme as we go along, 
that genes will explain basically your destiny in terms of health and future, but it's not quite as simple as that. It's gene environment interactions and this is the reason for uh, the, the title of that, of that talk. So here we have a little outlook, so I will s uh, spend a little bit of time to uh, share with you my way of at least a, a professional life and then um, go into uh, some aspects of genomics, also the personal aspects, and then this is really of course my shtick, you know, know everything from Jane, mass spec and omics, um, allude to the theme of systems biology and uh, bring some examples along as we go, and then also spend some time on uh, actual work that is now being carried out in my group here at the, um, at, uh, at the Liggins. So my way of life uh, looks uh, approximately as follows. Actually, I can skip that slide because you, you said everything. <laughs> you know, I'm born in Germany. I did my studies in Aachen in Constance. It's all done. I was in, I was in San Francisco and then I joined the Vikings. Uh, actually, <laughs> actually um, uh, uh, this, I first went to Denmark and then to Sweden. That was the only little thing that I could maybe add to what you said. And then I went to different places in Switzerland. I cannot add more uh, national flags, only cantonal flags. <laughs> Uh, the cantons are the little uh, states, federal states of Switzerland. Uh, and then I joined Nestle and by that time I also got affiliated with uh, the Danish University in Aarhus. And then I landed here in, in, in New Zealand. So that's my way of uh, professional life. And do you think there is a science career plan behind this? <laughs> I don't think so. And I will uh, try to explain why I, 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 I do not think so and why this has come this way. So I came from Switzerland to this place, and this is probably drawn to scale, uh, not in terms of volume. So Switzerland is a very small country, but very large in terms of volume. So if you flat it out, it's actually much bigger than, uh, <laughs> it's actually much bigger than New Zealand. Um, so I joined the uh, Liggins Institute because I think this one of the most meaningful things to work on is early life health. It's much better to work on something uh, to get it right in the first place, to prevent disease and to maintain health then only focusing on repair. Of course, we also must do repair. And this, my second hat um, is uh, not like this, but my second hat is function is to scientifically direct the National Science Challenge uh, High Value Nutrition, and that is one of 11 challenges in New Zealand here. Um, uh, I think it's one of the largest, and um, this is about uh, basic translational nutritional science and innovation in, 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 in the food sector. And I would not be here if I hadn't met three wise men. And I would like to uh, uh, thank those, uh, uh, those people the, uh, in the beginning of my talk, and I will thank many other people as we go along. The first guy I would like to thank is Peter Röpstorff. Uh, he is a Viking, he is a sailor, he is a chain smoker, um, and he's in perfect health. Um, and he is the father of mass spec based peptide and protein sequencing. Actually, he published a paper on the nomenclature of uh, ions that um, are generated when you put peptides in the mass spectrometer and you break it into pieces. And this follows certain rules. It's not a random process. So Peter introduced me to uh, mass spec and, and uh, protein and peptide sequencing. And I found this fascinating because um, this was a way, I mean, when these instruments came about, this was a way to uh, almo all of a sudden make biology much more molecular than it has been possible uh, before. He's a professor still at the University of Southern Denmark and he hired me as a, as a postdoc. The second person I'd like to thank is Denny Hochstrasser. He is uh, Swiss-French, which means he's Swiss but French-speaking. Um, he is the father of clinical proteomics and I worked with him uh, for the biotech um, uh, in, in, in Geneva, where, and that was one of the first, if not the first, industrial uh, biotechnology company that uh, was doing blood plasma proteomics for biomarker discovery in cardiovascular disease, and this was a collaboration with Novartis. Uh, he is a very good skier, um, and uh, I, was, uh, I, I share the passion for sailing with Peter and the passion for skiing with, with Denny, and uh, he is a professor at the University of Geneva uh, still. And the third gentleman I'd like to say is Laurent Fay. Uh, he is a Frenchman, uh, also a very good skier and a windsurfer. Uh, and um, we will come to that theme as we go along. I would call him the father of molecular nutrition. So I have a lot of fathers 
beside my own father who sits here. They, no, none of them comes as near, uh, anywhere close. But I have a number of uh, professional fathers, and, and uh, Laurent hired me at Nestle, uh, as uh, Jane uh, said, and he, he uh, is now head of uh, the infant nutrition R&D at Nestle. So without these three guys, I wouldn't be standing here. Now, when you meet all these mentors, it's important be for you because it has an impact. The mentor always sets the example, right? Peter here shows a very positive spirit. And he also uh, was very much interested in gene-environment interactions and promoting a very healthy lifestyle uh, here. And uh, so as we come along, we will see what kind of influence that had on my uh, further proceeding. So the theme here is genes, early nutrition, and health. And um, there are many reasons uh, why I think we are now doing this research as we do it today. I, come, I will come to the Human Genome Project in a minute, but one of the sobering uh, results of the Human Genome Project was it's only 23,000 genes. That's not much more than the fruit fly, and by all respect for the fly, I think there is a little bit difference of complexity. Uh, these genes cannot explain human complexity and individuality. Rather, it is the interaction of your genotype, uh, of your genotype with the environment that makes your phenotype, and this is uh, what we're looking at today. Another key thing that uh, brought me here is that nutrition has the most lifelong uh, health impact and that early life influences later life. And this all comes together uh, for a philosophy where we can maintain health and prevent disease, and these were five good reasons for me to come here. Now, let's spend a, a bit of a, a moment on personal genomics. Um, this is actually an outdated paper. Now, the human genome is, uh, it is year 17, and the older one of us uh, still remember when it was published. Bill Clinton was there and um, Craig Venter and the public consortium. There were basically two competing consortia. I mean, basically one company and a consortium were competing and they published at the same time what we now would call the, an average human genome sequence in just a human, but, but there was such a milestone and there, was very, there were very high expectations um, uh, in terms of disease prevention uh, at that time. Um, and I had actually the chance to meet Craig Venter in person 11 years later when he came to Nestle. It's a pretty impressive personality and he has uh, institutes uh, in, in the US. And um, so there was this publication of these 23,000 gene containing uh, genome where, and we heard this morning that most of the genome sequence is non-coding, which means it doesn't, most of the uh, sequence doesn't code for any proteins. So what is all the rest about? And this publication and this milestone in, in science has triggered uh, a lot of also commercial and consumer health output in the sense that companies were born that would sequence you in terms of genes and then tell you something about your health and disease risk and your prospects of how to stay healthy or not. And 23andMe, uh, I I've been in touch with them uh, while I was with Nestle. I dis uh, we had the chance to discuss with them. It's one of those companies where you basically take a buckle swap and you can uh, send, it, uh, send it in and they sequence you. Uh, so you have your personal genome sequence and then they come up with a risk score across basically every kind of disease you can imagine. So everything that can go wrong in your life except being hit by a meteorite maybe. Uh, so, and these risk scores are based on um, uh, risk factors that are associated with individual gene variants and so basically variants of gene sequence uh, that has been statistically associated with the risk of getting a certain disease or not. But what this does not do, so my question here is, is this really actionable? And we have discussed this this morning during the student, uh, all day during the student day. Is this pure sequence information actionable? And today we know it's not sufficient uh, to predict the future in terms of, uh, of, of, of health and, 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 and disease. Because what this uh, information not does not consider is gene-gene interactions, not so much, at least not what 23andMe does, and gene-environment interactions. So it's much more complicated than that. Now, that was one of the reasons why I got so fond of proteomics, and this is uh, uh, just a slide to, I think that nicely illustrates in simple terms what's the difference, these two, Different stages of life have the same genomes, but different proteomes. So it's the same sequence of genes that are, but different genes are made use of in different phases in, 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 in development. And this is why we, um, 
we study this. Learning from the example has always been very important. So you can see here that my mentor had a very good influence. Uh, I show here uh, my, the positive spirit definitely uh, smeared off. And I very readily adopted the lifestyle of the Vikings with uh, beer and some nicotine. So uh, this was a very positive influence. Now, the, the, the next uh, part of my talk is now about the, the tools and uh, that enables uh, the omics sciences downstream of genomics and especially mass spectrometry. And um, I would like to take you through some examples here. <laughs> I've grown up with Pink Floyd. I think it's the greatest rock band ever. I'm very uh, content and proud that my sons also like Pink Floyd, so they have a really good taste. Uh, but Pink Floyd is not only the best rock band ever, they're also very visionary in explaining mass spectrometry, but they didn't know at that time. So <laughs> basically what mass spectrometry does is you have here a beam of ions, let's say peptides, and then you separate them according to mass, much like the prism separates, spreads out the, the, the different uh, uh, wavelengths of the light spectrum. So here it's all one beam, and there you can separate uh, things by mass. And even tandem mass spectrometry has been uh, uh, greatly envisaged here, because what you can then do is you can pick one of those separate masses and sequence it down into the amino acids. So you have a stream of peptides here, pick one peptide and sequence uh, this into the amino acids. And this is the analogy of genome sequencing. It's just much more complicated in terms of uh, technique, and it's unfortunately not as fast and simple. So now let me take you through a few examples of how proteomics came along, and that makes me really feel old, because if you, if you look back uh, wh what you have been working on yourself, you, 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 you realize the technological progress over that time. It's, it's incredible. So proteomics in inverted commas 1997 looked like this. I was working uh, at the, uh, uh, they were still at the University of Constance and then I moved to Denmark to join Peter because we were very fond of a neural cell adhesion protein, Neuralin, um, which is um, involved in neural regeneration in fish. So fish can regenerate certain nerves and we know that we cannot. So this has a, a tremendous interest in, in medicine. Uh, and there is a model, uh, as a fish model, where you basically cut um, the nerve that connects the eye with the brain, and uh, there is a regeneration process that can restore this connection, and fish can do that. And Neuralin was involved in this, uh, in this process, and we were interested in its primary structure because some of the uh, function of this protein was due to glycosylation, and uh, this glycosylation was specific for certain interactions. So what this paper is about is about one protein, and we sequenced the heck out of it, so the, basically the whole amino acid sequence, and we knew where the glycosylation was. Paper done. Bon courage if you want to publish this today, <laughs> because it's one protein. Of course, you have all the information of the primary structure, but still, we worked on one protein, and this was a, you know, quite a, kind of a big deal. A few years later, um, when I worked um, in the biotech that was... Um, founded by Denny, um, we've been uh, going into much larger scale proteomics in the sense that we took lots and lots of blood of a pooled sample uh, from several donors in order to identify as many proteins as possible and then we would go into the individual samples of the patients we had and controls to see which biomarkers were in which sample. So there was first an identification database building phase and then there was a phase where we tried to understand who was uh, uh, at an elevated risk of cardiovascular disease versus uh, a lower risk of cardiovascular disease based on these biomarkers. And then that was based on 50 five mass spectrometers and lots of robots. And we also synthesized then some of these markers and targets that we had identified by chemical means. So this is not recombinant expression of proteins in cells or bacteria, but it is chemical synthesis. So what you can basically do is you can um, uh, synthesize uh, large pieces of polypeptides and then ligate them in the order you would like to do it. And the reason why we did it chemically at the time was that the purity and the yield is much higher than in expression system. This is also when you have the tools, it's much cheaper. So this was quite a, a difference in, in terms of what you would do in terms of proteomics. And very recently, when I was at Nestle and I had this fabulous team uh, there, we were 
uh, going into biomarker discovery in human plasma and this was more about not so, ma not so much about how many proteins can you see, how many translation modifications can you see. Uh, in the academic proteomics world, the race for protein numbers is very much on. But what people have, I think, underestimated is how difficult it is to analyze uh, a significant number of samples in a, significant, in, a, in a reasonable amount of time. So how do you deal with large-scale clinical studies? Because proteomics is much slower than genomics, that's, very, that's, that's for sure. So we came up with a workflow that was uh, based on a bio arranged from biobanking to tandem mass spec data analysis here. Uh, and uh, I will uh, cite an example of application of this workflow as we go uh, through the presentation. So this is another, I think, dimension because proteomics now becomes more relevant for uh, clinical research. For those of the PhD students that uh, want to do a postdoc, be aware, it's tough. <laughs> Physically and very tiring. So uh, I will come to that theme as we go along, but uh, a postdoc is always a big challenge and I uh, have myself uh, uh, experienced that. Now, the fourth part of my talk is, uh, I can't of course uh, resist on talking about systems biology and my uh, partner in crime and uh, 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 my um, boss in the high uh, value nutrition challenge, Joanne Todd, who is also in the audience, is, has by now means, I think, converted into systems biology too, biologist too. So systems biology, I would like to spend a few uh, moments about to, under, to share uh, my view about what this is and why we need it. So some of you know that slide, um, but I, I think it's still a good introduction of what it really means. Biological systems have been in, for many uh, years and for most of the molecular biology research, I think, been studied in, in the way that we would analyze the individual parts. So you have here, uh, basically, a, a disassembled car. And this is what is called reductionist approach. So you learn about the bits and pieces about the system, but you study them individually, okay? And that uh, gives, uh, of course, the basis of the key knowledge for more systems-oriented approaches, but it's still a study of individual elements. Now, again, I say this, I should change the slide in, uh, in, in times of the diesel scandal, but uh, I come from Germany, so I keep still the, the VW slide here. Um, systems have emergent properties that cannot be predicted by adding, basically, the properties of the individual parts. That's not possible. The sum is greater than, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. That's the connotation of systems biology. And um, this is actually particularly true for nutrition. So nutrition is, in my view, one of the best cases. Uh, I'm wandering around too much, right? I'm stressing the cameraman here. I can see he's, yeah, I'm very excited about what I do. So I never stay in one place. It's a bit like Heisenberg. You can never tell <laughs> place and time at the same moment. So that's, that's, you have to get used to that. Um, so the point here is that nutrition is a prime case of, um, for systems biology and we ca can even coin the word systems nutrition because we do not eat ingredients, we do not eat nutrients, we eat diets, okay? So it all comes together and it all interacts. So if you look at individual components at a time, it's just not good enough. So for those of you who are a little further away, for example, my, my dad is a lawyer, so he understands everything I'm, I'm talking about, but just maybe just a little analogy that helps those of you that are not too much into that kind of science. I think systems biology, you can look at it as a language of life, where you basically have an analogy here. Uh, you have an increasing complexity, so let's say we have here the bases that are the building blocks of, of the genes. Here we have the genes, the genome that express uh, other ohms as we go uh, further up in complexity and systems biology, in, at least in the molecular terms, embraces everything. And it's a little bit like when you go from letters to words to vocabulary to grammar to language. So it's a matter of at which level you want to study the system and how detailed you can study it at this complexity level. Systems biology can, for example, characterize the relationship between diet, microbiota and host phenotype and we are doing this here at the Liggins and also in conjunction with external uh, partners. 
so this is a, a f one of those examples where you can see diet is complex in co terms of composition. Microbiota, these are the bacteria that uh, colonize your, 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 um, your body. You're actually a, um, a, a eukaryotic minority in a prokaryotic ecosystem. So uh, you're just guest in, a, uh, in an ecosystem of bacteria when it comes to cell numbers. And there are other people here in the room that know much more about this. So if you want to study the relationship between diet, this ecosystem, and especially the ecosystem in the gut, and what is a resulting phenotype, so phenotype is basically a collection of observable traits and characteristics of an organism, systems biology is a good case. And now imagine you can do this at several levels. So, and this is what um, we, would, we can call molecular phenotyping. I've been spending quite some time on, on the genomics part, on the proteomics part, but there are other omics and everything ends up essentially in a complex picture of what makes you up as an individual in a given situation. And we have now, uh, we live now in a situation where we can measure all these things and that hasn't been possible for uh, a long time. So now I take you through a few examples of how this molecular phenotyping can uh, generate uh, useful information. And one of the pioneers of this was uh, Michael Snyder. I'd like to cite his paper and this is the personal omics profiling paper. What Michael Snyder did is he analyzed himself over time from all different kind of angles. This is uh, from an ethics point of view uh, actually a very good idea because uh, you can get it filed pretty easily because you don't have to ask all the participants, you just measure yourself. That was one of the reasons why he did it. And uh, of course from a technology point of view and interpretation point of view it's very complex and I don't want to uh, take you into too much detail but what he actually did is he omicked basically himself from all different kind of angles, plus he did clinical monitoring over time. He, he was observing himself over time. And with all these techniques we have discussed before. And one of the interesting outputs of this, uh, of this exercise was that he could discover that there was an infectious, um, an infection event uh, in his, uh, in his uh, trajectory that caused a pre-diabetic state and then he could correct for this by um, uh, nutritional adaptation. And retrospectively, this omic signature appeared earlier than as if he had waited for this pre-diabetic state to occur with classical diagnostic means. So for example, when you are uh, transiently glucose intolerant and, and you make the classical test. So this was one example of this multi-angle self-observation over time where you could see, okay, there was a moment in time where an infection caused a metabolic state that is not healthy and I can correct for it uh, for, uh, by, by nutritional means. Uh, my uh, groups have also worked on this molecular phenotyping in different contexts and one uh, example here is uh, infant health and here we have looked at uh, breastfeeding, uh, breastfed infants and uh, infants that were fed either a high or low uh, protein formula uh, and these infants were all born from uh, overweight and obese mothers. And we did this with uh, metabolomics techniques for once uh, not with mass spectrometry but with uh, NMR spectroscopy. That, that doesn't matter so much because the concept is the same. So what you see here on the slide is basically bars of different colors and they are grouped. So the different colors basically mean the different feeding regimen. So either the kids were, uh, the infants were breastfed or they received a high or low protein formula. These are the colors. And the three different bars here means time points, three, six, 12 months. So what you can do is in the metabolomic space is you, you measure all these small molecules, typically in urine or also in feces. So you have to be minimally invasive, especially when you work with infants. And you measure these molecules over time and then you can ask the question what happens over time. And if you integrate this information, uh, in this particular case we could for example see that the breastfed infants differed from the formula fed infants at different levels of, of metabolism. Carbohydrate metabolism, energy metabolism, lipid metabolism. And you can see here a few de details uh, where these uh, differences were observed. For example, of course breastfed infants showed milk oligosaccharides in the stool because only human breast milk has these complex oligosaccharides uh, that can actually give rise to, uh, to the growth of health beneficial bacteria in early life uh, infant guts. 
So this is just gives you a flavor of what you can do, and this is something also what we uh, uh, do here uh, at the ligands. Another example is in the gastrointestinal health, and uh, here we looked at children uh, that were either healthy or affected by IBD, and IBD stands for inflammatory bowel disease. Um, when uh, children are affected by inflammatory bowel disease, it's actually very problematic, not only because the gut uh, uh, is, uh, causes a lot of pain, but also they don't grow well, they don't dwell, uh, they, they can stunt actually, and they don't develop as they should. So if, the, if you do not um, diagnose and correct for IBD in children, they simply don't develop as they should. And here we also did a metabonomics exercise, so we minimally invasive took samples from urine and, and other sources, and then what you can do is you can see where do your metabolites fall onto in terms of biochemical pathways, and where do you see the most significant changes. And here the take-home message is that this non-invasive urine sampling and the longitudinal design, which means you looked at the same infant over time, so you observed healthy children over time, how they grew, and the IBD affected children over time, how they grow. Um, you can identify molecular profiles that are actually linked um, to uh, uh, specific uh, deficits that are observed in uh, IBD affected children, so, and then you can correct for them. So you can see where the metabolism differs between the diseased and the healthy infants, and you can nutritionally intervene to compensate for these uh, for example, um, uh, observations that have to do with malabsorption of certain nutrients. IBD children have usually problems with absorbing nutrients in sufficient uh, um, um, quantities. Um, a further example here is uh, about the metabolic health uh, area, and here we have um, uh, studied uh, a large cohort of overweight uh, subjects in a European uh, collaborative study, and, and uh, my now ex-colleagues are still uh, working on, 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 on these data. So here uh, we have uh, recruited uh, obese uh, uh, subjects at a certain moment in time, and then they were screened, then they were put on a weight loss uh, diet, and then they were put on four different diets in order to see who is able to maintain the weight, uh, or who regains weight, or who further loses weight when uh, this weight loss uh, diet uh, uh, has been, uh, had been completed. So you don't need omics to know that if you are on 800 kilocalories per day, you lose weight. I'm glad I was not part of that study. That's not much. But what the interesting thing is that usually it's so difficult to keep the weight off once you have lost it. And if we had analyzed this, um, this, uh, these individuals in a classical fashion, basically by group, so you say the individuals that are on high protein, low GI, uh, um, low protein, high GI, and uh, all the permutations, we had four different diets, then you would have said, okay, on average, high protein and low GI is better than the other diets. Well, that we knew before. But when you look at individuals, is that in each and every dietary intervention group, all trajectories were present. So there were successful people in all different uh, groups, and there were non-successful people in all different groups. And one of the questions we had is, can we predict this success? Can we say what happens here at this baseline? And yes, we can, to cite an uh, uh, American president who is unfortunately no longer in charge, um, but that's a different story. So uh, we, can uh, we, can, we can say we can do this in the sense that we can tell at baseline based on a proteomic signature that we derived from human blood plasma, and that was exactly the workflow I've shown you before. Remember the analysis of the thousand samples in, in, a clinical, in a clinical study? This was exactly the tools that were used to address this, and so we can say here uh, um, a, a signature, a protein signature at baseline at time zero, uh, consisting of 23 different markers, can tell you who should actually use which diet in order to be successful. We also uh, have been working on cognition. That is something that is maybe not so uh, present here at the ligands, but in terms of infant development, definitely yes. Uh, and here we um, uh, developed um, um, a panel of uh, um, uh, analytes that are 
uh, involved in, uh, or met metabolites are involved in the one carbon metabolism. One carbon metabolism is a key pathway in the body that provides uh, the body with the building blocks of, uh, of, of one carbon uh, units. And um, we worked here on cognitive decline. And um, so we had a cohort of people, of elderly uh, uh, people that were either on uh, declining cognitively or uh, mentally performing uh, consistently over time. So we had different time points. And here the um, message is that we know that high homocysteine levels uh, and especially in CSF, so this is cerebral, cerebral spinal fluid. That's the fluid that surrounds the brain and is, uh, is also in the, in, the, in the spinal cord. That is a risk factor for cognitive decline and dementia. Uh, and also uh, this includes Alzheimer's disease. And there is currently in the clinics, there is a reference model being applied. Uh, a reference model means it's a collection of um, data points uh, uh, that are statistically interpreted and, uh, uh, and that are used for diagnosis. And this uh, includes age, so aging is not good, um, unfortunately. Years of education, A beta 1 to 42 stands for amyloid beta peptide, and that is a feature of Alzheimer's disease where this uh, peptide is miscleaved and causes plaques. And these are uh, is another protein which is uh, erroneously phosphorylated and not the way it should be phosphorylated. And if you look, look at this classical model, the diagnostic accuracy is about 80%. So we came up with two models based on either CSF-derived or plasma-derived metabolites of the uh, uh, one-carbon metabolism. And because this is, a, molecularly speaking, quite a, a, a complex uh, panel we could, we could uh, tap into and we could analytically um, um, uh, grasp, uh, we, could, we can see here that our diagnostic accuracy uh, actually surpassed uh, the one with the classical model. Now this has of course to be validated in other cohorts, but this is a good example of uh, where molecular phenotyping can be also very useful for uh, diagnostics. Uh, in, if you display this in another way, you can see here uh, uh, when you have these uh, graphs here that basically plot the true positive rate uh, over the false positive rate. So this means sensitivity versus specificity. If you have here a diagonal, this is flipping a coin. So this uh, is just chance, you can't tell anything. And you want this area under that curve to be very, very large. So the larger this area is, the better the predictive power. And you can see here that our model performs better than the reference model. And we have a subsequent paper now ongoing also in Alzheimer's research and therapy where we did this plasma. Uh, values. So also other scientists are fun of mass spec and hopefully you are uh, now uh, the same. It is also used in forensics. Um, so uh, this just to underline the power of this uh, technology. Um, am I okay with time? It's the last, uh, last part. Is all right? Yeah. I wouldn't tell it anyway. So, <laughs> uh, so I would now like to uh, tell you a little bit what the group, uh, my uh, relatively new group here at the Ligands is doing. You have been, uh, some of you may have been listening to uh, Shika's talk about uh, human breast milk and uh, infant health outcomes. Uh, she gave a public lecture the other day. You may have heard uh, Stephanie speaking this morning about um, early life uh, uh, cell-free DNA diagnostics uh, to grasp, uh, to capture uh, influences of maternal nutrition on early life health. And what I would like to present here is actually a project that is uh, funded by High Value Nutrition by the National Science Challenge. Um, and uh, Claire Wall is also in the room and uh, the two of us, we are running this. Uh, Claire is a pediatrician and, and a nutritionist and uh, I try to bring this omic stuff into the uh, game. So we are interested in weaning, that is uh, the moment or the period in life where either breastfeeding or formula feeding in infants is being phased out and the introduction of solid foods is gradually being phased in. And that typically happens, it's culturally a bit dependent. Uh, here I think it happens around six months of age. In other countries uh, it may be later. Uh, but this is what it is about. And because you change food dramatically, also the microbiome changes and the microbiome, especially those bacteria that are residing in the gut. So this uh, graph uh, uh, or this illustration just summarizes a bit the influences uh, that determine 
and can influence um, a later life microbiome, especially in intestinal microbiome. So we have here birth, uh, the first year of life, and then the toddler age. We are also speaking about the first thousand days of life that are very important. That's approximately three years. Um, so there are maternal factors, postnatal factors, and even later factors that influence the microbiome. Um, so there's gut microbiota from the mother, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a vaginal microbiota, then the birth uh, uh, delivery matters, whether it's vaginal or cesarean, that has an influence on the composition. And then here we are in the weaning space where solid food is introduced. And of course, these bacteria live also on what we eat. So they are commensals, they are at the table. And uh, this has a strong influence about the later life uh, immune, immune and metabolic health uh, as the microbiome changes. So the copyright for this um, title goes to Frank. Um, uh, and um, I'm, Frank said, why don't, why don't you call it Seeding Through Feeding? I think this is a real cool project title. And maybe it helped us defending it, uh, getting funded by High Value Nutrition. So we had um, um, the question whether we can promote healthy immunity in infants around weaning by feeding immune beneficial bacteria as members of the infant gut microbiome. That was the essential question we had. And the classical approach would have been feed and bleed. Or you could say testing prebiotic candidates. So there are, it's not like we don't know anything about it. We, have, we, have, we know that some prebiotic uh, and prebiotics basically means it's a nutrient for a probiotic, and probiotic means it's a health beneficial bacterium. So these are the three um, names you, or terms you have to remember. So the classical uh, approach would be feeding and bleeding, which means testing uh, candidates. Uh, but we had, that would be the classical uh, workflow here, but our approach was different. We said, well, we, we would like to go about it with reverse genomics, which means we define an, a health benefit. We ask what part of the ecosystem in the gut could contribute to this health benefit. And then we ask the question on which prebiotics do these bacteria feed and where we can find these uh, feed in the, in the food space. So it's working from the benefit end backwards rather than testing and see what happens. And um, I think we have by now, although the project is still very young, a nice proof of concept. Uh, and we work here together with uh, COSPI, which is a systems biology institute in, in Italy, and uh, Biju, I don't know whether he is in the room. Uh, he is a postdoc in my group, and he is uh, driving this. So what we basically did is we went to the public domain and uh, bioinformatically searched for good food for good bugs. And what does this mean? Well, this is a sophisticated shirt. It's a little more sophisticated than PubMed. <laughs> so what COSPI has is essentially um, um, they can develop um, vocabularies, dictionaries, and they can develop intelligent text mining, full text mining tools in order to retrieve information from the public domain that you could never retrieve by reading all these papers because it's just impossible to do. So we went through about 30, 37,000 PubMed microbiome publications, and you can see uh, how big this, this, this space is. And this search yielded uh, approximately 2,000 papers that were related to infant gut microbiome and immunity because this was our health benefit we were focusing on. We were interested in bacteria that can protect infants from infections. So the outcome would be infants have less or fewer infections. Then we boiled it down to about 50 bacterial genera and about f which correspond to about 500 bacterial species in the human gut around that uh, time in life. And uh, 10 of these bacterial genera and uh, 50 of these species were specifically related to infant gut microbiome and immunity. So you basically study all or retrieve all the microbiome studies that have been published and you boil it down to what matters for your research question. And uh, the nice thing about this approach is not only did we discover, of course, new candidates, we also found things we were expected to find. So this is like in analytics, if you, if, you, if you want to discover new biomarkers, you better make sure that you see molecules and markers that you are expected to see, so you're sensitive and specific enough. So lactobacilli and bifidobacteria, for example, we found. And then you can try to illustrate this. Uh, and you know, this is one of those slides where one used to say, I don't want to go into detail, which means you can't read it. Um, 
But uh, what my point here is that we have basically wheels of interactions um, or connections where on the one hand we have the bacteria and if it's health, uh, health beneficial we can say probiotics. On the other side we have the nutrients, the prebiotics. And then we can zoom in and try to understand who feeds on what. And for example here you can actually, I think you can read it with a little bit of fantasy, that the bifidobacterium longum feeds for example among many other uh, nutrients on uh, L rhamnose, which is a, a fairly simple uh, sugar. And what you can also do is when you have these wheels of connections, you can ask the question of competition. So are uh, different bugs competing for the same nutrients? And you can also ask the question, where's cooperativity? So some, nu some bacteria provide nutrients for others. So this is more the ecosystem perspective. So it's too simple to say, well, we find a bug that we can feed and the bug is, has, has, a, has a health benefit. We also need to consider the ecological context. And then you can ask the question, where, where do we find the nutrients that are so attractive? So again, you have here the nutrients, the prebiotics, here the food sources, and then you can zoom in. And for example, you can see here that the, um, uh, what is it here, the uh, common walnut contains uh, uh, cystothione as a, a prebiotic nutrient and you can do this in many other ways. So we are now going through this kind of information and uh, this uh, discovery approach or this in silico approach has informed the design of the complementary feed that we are now designing in a clinical trial uh, where we feed about 50 infants with um, um, a prebiotic uh, whole food and uh, we came up with Kumara as a, as a good source of some of these prebiotics we have found. Uh, and so uh, this approach can uh, inform the design of a complementary or weaning food that we are now applying in a clinical trial to see whether we can, um, uh, whether we can have success in seeding the right bacteria with the right uh, food. I come to uh, pretty much the end of the talk by just summarizing a little bit where we stand. So I would just like to highlight this uh, collaborative paper here that has tried to uh, define um, some major nutrition research goals of the years to come and um, so just to say that um, I believe that with this kind of research it's, it's more than having a few good ideas over uh, a nice glass of Sauvignon in, from Marlboro Sound so I think we are pretty much uh, spot on then because if you look at what the nutrition research community thinks is, is, is uh, um, is something we, we need to do is first of all um, it's identifying and mitigating the errors in nutritional science and errors in nutritional science traditionally I think have been mainly due to too much reductionism and also maybe a little too little um, innovative clinical designs. So we are very much locked into case control designs based on limited phenotyping. So longitudinal studies where you are your own case and control can contribute to change that. Second theme that was mentioned, nourishing the immune system. Uh, of course, you have seen examples that we are working on this. Uh, human of microbiome, I think there's no grant that can be written without mentioning this. Uh, it is uh, definitely something which uh, is on uh, top of the nutrition research agenda. And then, of course, it's a lot about big data, and it's not only uh, storing the data and making them accessible, it's interpreting uh, these data. Because you can imagine of, that from all these different uh, toolboxes, there's an enormous set of data emerging, but that, that doesn't necessarily mean information. We have to convert it to information. So I, I'm, I will wrap up now by, I think, maybe sharing a few statements for the young folks in the, in the room here. Uh, I think there has never been a better time for doing science because the bottleneck has been moving from basically the laboratory to the brain. I think not so long ago it was difficult to measure things and now we can actually measure many more things than our brain can digest. So this means scientific brains are needed more than ever because interpretation cannot be automated. I mean you can use, you can use computers of course for and, and algorithms and, and programs to visualize uh, uh, things you may not see but you need to interpret it. A few words I would like to say for those uh, uh, that are still at the very early career phase and I wish I, I, I was there still. I think you should follow your passion, you should be mobile and I think there is no such thing that science is either applied 
and a bit more boring, but you get industry money for it, or it's um, more sexy and more academic, but it's very difficult to, to, to get funded. I mean, science, is, I think, has to be excellent and relevant, and if it's excellent and relevant at the same time, it's going to be picked up. I think working at interfaces is always a, a very exciting uh, idea. I've been spending a lot of time at the public-private interface, and I'm doing this here as well, so high value nutrition has a lot of commercial uh, spin, and at the same time we do a lot of basic science here at the Wiggins. Uh, well, that's a very, uh, th these are now the human factors. I think it's very important to build and maintain good relationships uh, and also to choose good mentors, as you have seen, because they can have such a wonderful influence on you. I hope uh, this is um, <laughs> my uh, sum summary of about 45 minutes. I think this was the, pre uh, the most awarded uh, banner uh, during the March of Science in the U.S. Uh, where uh, a lot of people were a bit concerned uh, about what would happen to uh, science in, with the new administration. I would like to thank my ex-team at Nestle. Uh, they have been, I mean, most of the things I have presented still stems from that time. I would also, of course, warmly thank my new team here at the Ligands with some very recent additions, and we can never be on the same photo because uh, always somebody is not here. Um, so thank you to those uh, wonderful people that um, uh, made it possible here to start my research here at the, at the Ligands and in HVN. I would like to thank my family. Some of them are here in the room. Uh, they have been supporting me over all this, uh, along all this journey. And I would like to come back to the central theme of my talk and still say you can still do it as a professor. Um, <laughs> now you can, of course, say, well, this could be anybody. But um, because you cannot recognize me, but uh, the author, the copyright uh, of this video sits in the room, that's Jonas, who is by now the much better windsurfer. But if you have doubts who that is, I think he can uh, testify that it's me. Thank you very much for staying with me after such a long day, and uh, it was wonderful to, to spend this moment with you here. Thank you. through your life, technology, omics, systems biology, but how all those things can interact together to make a difference to health. And you also added in the final part that makes a really good inaugural lecture, which is to be sometimes a little bit controversial and a little bit provocative by saying that why a science plan doesn't make sense. And it was provocative enough such that Radio New Zealand have booked an interview slot with Martin next week to find out exactly what he means by that. <laughs> so. Yeah, at least the title is cool. Now when they find out about the story, maybe they don't. <laughs> <laughs> I think they will. Based on what we've heard tonight, I think they'll be very interested indeed. So thank you again very much. Very, thank you again, Martin, very much for that wonderful lecture. And um, it's great to have you as a member of the professoriate. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. That's the end.